Today we're going to talk to you about a terraplane and cattail foundry project that we've done that most people will know nothing about and have never seen. So in just a moment we're going to get involved in showing you what goes on with correctly mounting a side mount lock system. First we're going to take off the hub cap which is on the side mount here and that covers up the lock mechanism, except there isn't a lock mechanism. You can see here we cheated and made up a couple of washers, welded them together, and used a bolt. This is what I've had on the car for years, and it's not correct. Because I never had everything until just recently to put the correct equipment in here. What should be going on is this piece actually should be shaped and come up and grab onto that. And then there should be a lock mechanism. And we're about to show you the real parts that go here and how they mount and tell you a little bit about how we made them as well as we're going to show you some original literature and a copy of an original parts book that give you some interesting things about how we even ordered parts if it was 1937. Here we have a Hudson Master Chassis Group parts book for 1930 to 39. This is a reproduction book. We also have behind it a preliminary parts book for 1937 Hudson and Terraplane. This is not a reproduction. This is the actual book done by Hudson back in the 30s. We're going to first look in the reproduction book here. I have the page marked with the paper. And we're going to look at page 82, which is labeled plate 16. And up here, the top drawing tells us the side wheel carrier for 37 and 38. Well, we have a 37 Terraplane cab pickup, so this is our side wheel carrier. And remember, I told you initially we have the wrong part. But this piece right here, E815, which in a reproduction is hard to see all the details, but E815 is the piece we actually are supposed to put on the car to hold the tire. Also, there's an E818 here, which is the lock mechanism and two keys, and an E812, which is the bolt that goes in the hole and holds the whole thing together. Now, quite a number of years ago, I found, and I'll grab that for you, an E818. That's new old stock. Found that on eBay, complete with keys. It's never been on a vehicle. And that's E818 right there. There we've got a real E818. I've had that for quite a while. But I didn't have these other two pieces. Now E812 I made out of a couple of bolts. And you can see I went down to the hardware store and I got one bolt and used the Sherline lathe to refasten the fashion the bolt into what I needed because the top really needed to look like this and we can see that in the actual little drawing where you've got a collar and then you actually have another bolt at the top that's this portion. So this is made out of two bolts one I've machined with a Sherline lathe on the outside and threaded it screwed my other bolt into it and figuring out the distance was totally related to the fact that inside the back of the lock there's a little piece here that operates when you turn your key. And that piece goes right under here. So if I turn the key, I can stick the two together, get it in there, and it's actually locked in place. That's E12. So E12 I made up out of a couple of parts out of a hardware store. So we've got an E12 and we've got an E818 here. Now we need an E815. Now E815 we didn't have one of, but we have all the dimensions on the car and on the wheel, and we have a drawing here, at least a picture that's been reproduced that we could work with. And so here we have our pattern right here for an E815. This was made out of a series of laser cut pieces of basswood that I drew up on the computer, and we'll show you the file that we used and how, we, how the various pieces were. We then glued those together and we finished them up with angled edges. If you were looking at this, all these have a draft on them. So that when this pattern would be stuck in sand, you could take it out and it would have a draft so that the part could come out of the sand easily, both when it is being made and when it's cast. When you look on the side here, you can see if you look real careful, that's actually got a draft on it. 
So you can see every single surface on here has a draft so you could remove this. And it was finished with finer and finer grades of sandpaper and lots of Krylon primer and ultimately I just had some Krylon blue that I sprayed it with because I happened to have it. So that's why it's blue, not any other reason. It was just a can of paint I had laying around. So that's the pattern. And this pattern's actually been used by the foundry to do what was necessary. Now, as I said, it was done on the computer for a layout and drawing, taking all the measurements, drawing it together, gluing it up, etc., out of the pieces. Now we'll show you the actual reproduction part. And the reproduction part came from Cattail Foundry, and all of about two weeks ago, and this is in June, early June 2019, about two weeks ago, we sent them that pattern. And here we have back the actual piece cast from that part. And I got to tell you, that's pretty darn beautiful because it's supposed to have a cast finish on it. It isn't supposed to be all smooth like we had it. And furthermore, a two-week turnaround was amazing, and it cost an unreasonably little amount of money, almost nothing. And actually, the part only cost 50 cents more than the shipping. We we're just amazed at how reasonable it runs. Now, we've used Cattail Foundry before. It's an Amish foundry, and as you can see, they do fantastic work. And I'll show you what actually happens. This is where the lock goes. And this is direct from our pattern. Now, we made sure everything fit beforehand, and we knew that Emmanuel who runs this could actually cast with a low amount of shrinkage. There's very little shrinkage and everything fits together beautifully. So that's where the lock will actually sit. And of course our bolt actually goes in here. And when we put it on the car in a bit, we'll show you what it looks like when it's all finished up. But that's the part we had made at Cattail Foundry. And Trish will put information on how to get a hold of Cat Cattail Foundry in the description if you want to know that. So you'll see that in the description. So you can get parts cast if you want to, too. Amazing work, amazingly low price, um, easy to deal with. You know, they don't take credit cards, so don't be looking for that. They only take a payment like by check, and believe it or not, there's a way to call them, but they always call you back. And that's pretty amazing that an Amish person actually will call you back and talk to you about stuff if you need to. So we'll go from there. Now we're going to take off of our substitute piece that we've had here all these years. It worked, but it's clearly not correct. So we remove it from the car. I'm going to set the wrench down so I got two hands to do this. Don't drop anything. And we'll move that out of the way. Now through the magic of video, ta-da, it's all black this time and painted. And you see it fits just like that. It's actually supposed to hang on the little post there. And we get our new correct bolt, which is used with our lock. And we start it threading in. And you notice we have a different end size here. We'll use a different wrench to install it. Now, if you're actually doing this on the car and we're changing a tire, you'd have a tire iron you'd be using. The tire iron would fit this just fine, just like it would fit the bolts on your wheels. But since I'm in the garage and have a ratchet, we're going with a ratchet. Bring this down into position. Almost there. And you see that little collar had to be on there because it catches the actual tire retainer like that. And now we're going to get our little lock mechanism. Open it up. Oops. Didn't quite get it. Admittedly, I've never locked it before. So I gotta figure out exactly which direction I gotta go to lock. But there we have the little unit 
in place. And that's basically what you're supposed to have when you're done. And then of course you put your hubcap back on the outside and it's all finished up. When we're looking at the plate here in the parts book, let's say E815 that we didn't have and it's 1937 and we want to get an E815 because somebody lost the E815 on their vehicle. If we look at the bottom of this page, it shows it as plate 16. Well, something's not quite in agreement whether when somebody reproduced the book or whether the book actually does have an error. This is listed as plate 16, but when we actually study it, we find out that it's listed here as plate 15, and the part we're actually after is E815, which is the wheel carrier lock cage assembly. And the one on the 1937 is BZ121694, which I wrote down over here on a piece of paper. So we've got the E815 is BZ121694. Now the question is, how would we order that in the 30s? Now if we're a Hudson dealer or we're a job shop that's going to fix this, we're going to have to order it one of two ways. Now it's true you could make a phone call, but that's not the way anybody did it. For example, from Prescott, Arizona, a phone call to Detroit, Michigan in the 1930s probably meant calling Phoenix, having Phoenix sit, route the call all the way to Detroit, and it'd probably take a couple hours for him to set it up, and it would cost us a mint, so we're not going to make a phone call in the 1930s. That leaves us two ways to do it. We can write for it through the mail, and if nobody's in a hurry, that's probably what they do. But let's say we got to get that piece because the customer wants to leave town with the car. How are we going to get it? Well, in the 21st century, of course, you'd have done email or you'd have called them on the phone because it doesn't cost anything on a cell phone. But in the 1930s, you do something different. You actually use a telegraph. And the interesting thing about the telegraph is if we open our preliminary parts book that we've got here, it has information in it that tells us about how to telegraph four parts. Right here on page true. Parts telegraph code, one of the most interesting things I've seen. We can go down a whole little chart here showing things like shipped to us by Air Express. So if we wanted to say that in a telegram, we'd say W-U-P-T-A. So we'd say WUPTA. And we would give them our address and who we are, and we'd give them our part number. So it would be something like this. If you were going to order that, Air Express, you'd have something like that, Wupta. Then we're going to put Bob's Car Repair. That's who we're going to be. And we're going to give our address as Prescott AZ. And in the 1930s, that's all you're going to need to find Bob's Car Repair in Prescott AZ. Then the other thing you're going to include is BZ121694. I left off my four up here, but we're really supposed to have a four. This is what you'd actually send to them, and that would tell you to ship at Air Express. Now, one other thing you want to tell them, though, is you want to tell them how you're going to pay for it. So if we look back at our book, we don't have an account, so we're going to ask for COD. So we could go W-U-T-A-E. So W-U-T-A-E could be used instead of this word. We put W-U-T-A-E. So this whole thing is all you would send via telegraph to Hudson in Detroit, and they'd ship you the parts you need. <laughs> just for the test. Oh darn it. What? I don't like the way the lab post looks. It's literally coming off the bottom of the pickup. It, is, it looks funky. Here, come on. No, you're just, you want me to move it again.